Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining our webinar today. Uh, in the next half hour or so, I'll be talking with Dr. Emil von Schreiber, the Managing Director of Luminogic and the creator of Hypermine, about why prediction markets work so well and why they're so accurate. Uh, if you have any questions during the webinar, feel free to email them to events at predictit.org. Uh, Emil Servan Schreiber is one of the world's top experts in prediction markets. Formerly the CEO of New Futures, Mr. Servan Schreiber is now the managing director for Luminogic and Hypermind, which both focus on collecting the wisdom of the crowd from prediction markets. He pioneered, he pioneered many business applications of prediction markets for dozens of leading companies on four continents. His work on prediction markets has been featured in the best-selling book, The Wisdom of Crowds, as well as the New York Times, The Economist, The Financial Times, The Wall Street Journal, The New Yorker, Le Monde, and many more. His work with prediction markets made him a pioneer in the field. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today, Mill. Thank you very much for having me. Of course. Um, so I guess we'll just go ahead and get started. Um, so my first question is, um, so what made you so interested in prediction markets in the first place? Well, uh, I come to this um, from a different angle than most people. Most people uh, came to this from the economic uh, science. And most people who have been proponents of prediction markets have been economists. Uh, my own background is more uh, in psychology, in cognitive psychology. And I was interested in prediction markets because of its collective intelligence aspect. Uh, in many respects, I think a prediction market and a crowd of traders behave very much like a network of neurons in a brain. Uh, nobody is very, uh, is, is completely cognizant of everything and able to do the best predictions all the time. Uh, so they're like individual neurons who cannot do much uh, individually. Uh, but when you put them together and when you eliminate the bad connections, the bad traders, and you enhance the good connections in the brain or the good traders in the market, then you end up with uh, this emerging quality of intelligence. And that's how I became interested in prediction markets. Uh, that's really interesting um, that you, um, you know, associate more of the cognitive psychology stance, um, you know, versus other people who study it um, in economics, like you said before. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about um, the founding of New, New Futures, uh, now Luminogic? Sure. So we created New Futures in 2000, uh, about the same time that uh, this website called Intrade, now defunct, uh, was created. Uh, the difference was News Futures was doing exactly the same thing as that Intrade was doing, except it was doing it from the play money perspective because we were operating in France and in the US where it was illegal to, to do real money markets. So we had to do with play money, uh, which eventually led us after a stint with uh, usatoday.com for a few years to uh, branch into doing more corporate prediction market work. So putting prediction markets to use inside companies to enhance the ability to predict uh, sales or to predict innovations that might be successful. And these futures eventually uh, ended up uh, becoming less of a technology provider and more of a consulting shop so nowadays, it's, uh, it's very much focused both in Europe and in the US into um, creating markets targeted at innovation and forecasting inside companies and providing a host of analysis uh, that enables you to get the most value out of it. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, um, I think that's uh, really interesting. Um, can you also tell us about um, the creation of uh, Hypermine and how Hypermine came to be? Excellent question. So we collaborated uh, for the last few years with a project, academic project, research project financed by the intelligence community in the US. Uh, through an agency called IARPA, which is the equivalent of DARPA, you know, the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, except it's for the intelligence community. And they 
had heard about the wisdom of crowds, they heard about prediction markets, and they wanted to find out through a multi-year, uh, multi-million dollar research project whether the wisdom of crowds could be put to good use in enhancing the quality of their geopolitical predictions. So the agencies every day had to put out a number of predictions uh, in the president's desk. And uh, have, those predictions, as we know, aren't always up to par. Uh, so they want to see whether they could crowdsource these predictions and what would be the best algorithms and the best methods to uh, consolidate the predictions of hundreds of people who would not necessarily be professionals at intelligence analysis. So this went on for a few years. Uh, it was headed by somebody at Walton called uh, Philip Tetlock, who recently wrote a book called Super Forecasting. And the results of this uh, long experiment, the biggest forecasting experiment in the world in the history of, of man, actually, uh, was very, very striking and very new. So the first result was that a few hundred amateurs uh, in geopolitics, somebody who would get paid you know, $200 to participate to answer hundreds of, of questions or trade on hundreds of questions, are very detailed. Uh, if you took a hundred of them, uh, you could do as well or even better than the professional intelligent analysts inside the CIA, for example. And if you select those people properly, you could do even 30% better than the professionals at the CIA. That's the first result. Second result is that not everybody performs as well as everybody else. Uh, not every amateur or every professional is, is uh, performing exactly the same way. And so the project that what makes somebody good at prediction or somebody good at being a prediction trader in the market. And the result of that is that there are some people who perform way better than others, and those people are the opposite of ideologues. They are the people who are mostly very curious and extremely data-driven. So they don't build a model of what the world is like before they actively go out and speak to everybody else who might disagree with them first. Right? And they, they get very informed before they place a bet. So these are the people that have the right profile to be excellent at forecasting. We call them actively open-minded thinkers. They are actively open-minded. They seek contradiction before they make their own opinions final. And when you That's take, when you identify those people, when you identify those people, they are the same from year to year. So it's a stable cognitive skill. And those are the people that Philip Tetlock ended up calling super forecasters. And I'm sure there's some of them on this call today. Um, that's really interesting. So. Um, so what you were saying just now about people being, um, you know, the ideal trader maybe is like an opposite of an ideologue and they're very data driven. So um, as far as, um, you know, a lot of our traders, a lot of them, of course, are extremely intelligent, um, very informed. But um, I think we have some people on the site as well who, um, you know, may just be coming into learning about politics, um, maybe for the first time, maybe this is the first election that got them really interested. Um, in current events regarding politics and what's been happening with the 2016 election. So um, wh what do you think about you know, people that are you know, really intelligent on um, how they make their decisions um, and how they're so informed versus people who might just be learning about um, the subject that they're predicting on for the first time? Well, you have to be extremely careful when you swim among sharks that you don't get eaten alive uh, before you you have a chance to become a shark yourself. So if you're a first-time trader, uh, you know, whether in predicted or hypermind or any other market, you have to be very careful uh, that you don't bet everything, all the money you can spend uh, on, on, on some risky thing uh, at the start. Uh, make sure you 
Let's make sure you think very deeply and get the most information you can and get some discussions going in the, in the forum discussions uh, that accompany the market uh, so that you understand what you're getting into and don't bet everything stupidly and, and some, you know, trying to make it big immediately. That's a mistake that we see being made very commonly by first timers. That's very so interesting. Um, just, go ahead. Just, just to finish on the question you had uh, about Hypermind, is following this, these discoveries from uh, this big long research project, we figured that you know, there's one business model that, that is the predicted business model where people actually pay to play. Right? Uh, and then there's the, another business model where we can just gather the super forecasters, just uh, recruit the best of the best, put them into a semi-private market, and then feed, uh, you know, allow uh, companies and governments and whoever to ask questions of this big brain uh, and get the real-time forecasting out of it. And that's what Hypermind is about. Huh, that's, um, that's very insightful. Um, and so going on about um, Hypermind, what do you think is um, what are your most intriguing findings that you found um, while researching Hypermind? Well, one really interesting thing is, um, and it's actually a, a result of the, the research project as well, is that teaming, uh, working as a team, makes the uh, predictions better. So it's important for the quality of, of the predictions from Hypermind or from Predicted or any other market that there are active discussions going where people actually exchange information uh, so that everybody is more informed and that makes the prediction better for everyone. That makes Predicted even a better source of information uh, and that benefits everybody. That's one thing I, I would uh, uh, I would suggest that you insist very much upon is provide incentives for people to uh, or actually make them understand that the more they participate to live discussions on the site with other traders and the more they exchange information and useful links, the better it is for everybody because the market is going to be better, its reputation is going to be better, etc. That's one thing. The other thing yeah. is that we can observe, uh, even in these uh, election markets today, uh, we can observe that different markets with different types of populations and traders uh, behave a little bit differently. So for example, we see that Hypermine, which has more of a European slant than Predicted, which is more of a Washington DC uh, semi-professionals based uh, market in politics, have a different opinion on Donald Trump, for example, and his chance of success at the nomination. So that the, the Europeans with a sort of a perhaps more perspective or have a, tend to overvalue Trump by about 10% compared to uh, predicted. And that tells me, I don't know which one is right or which one is wrong at this stage, obviously. But that tells me that different markets can have different personalities, just like two different brains uh, would probably differ about the way they approach the same issue. Uh, just because your prediction market doesn't mean you're exactly like any other prediction market. You have your own personality. And predictive as its own personality, and Bedfair as its own personality, and Hypermind as its own personality. And if you understand uh, where that personality comes from, that helps you also be a better trader in that particular community that you're involved with. That's really fascinating. Yeah, I, I hadn't thought about that before. Um, and um, yeah, I think that's really interesting just because um, I think obviously the audiences of all these different prediction markets, like you said, you know, based on you know, geographic location or whatever, um, you know, it comes through um, as a different um, personality in each of these, you know, different um, prediction markets. Um, so shifting focus just a little bit, um, I wanted to um, pull a quote from your research article entitled Hypermind versus Big Data, um, in which you wrote, uh, our results show that the aggregated brain power of a prediction market even a small one, even a plain money one, can outpredict a variety of the most sophisticated data-driven statistical models recently developed 
by the largest U.S. media organizations and academic researchers. So I wanted to talk a little bit with you about um, the accuracy of prediction markets versus um, some of those statistical models. Um, so what exactly accounts for the accuracy that comes from a crowd of people in the prediction market? Um, and how does that brain power um, beat other statistical prediction models? OK, so these are two very deep questions. <laughs> um, so on to the first one. So I think there are three drivers to making a prediction market smart. Uh, the first driver is that the betting proposition itself uh, has a way of attracting a lot of diversity into the market. So everybody in the market self-recruits, right? It's not like a poll where you have to go out and, and, and find people who are, who are representative of something. Uh, in the market, you are, you are self-recruited because you think you know better than other people. And I think, in fact, that's one of the uh, you know, taglines of predict it is like, you, you think you know politics better than other people, so join the market, right? So that tends to attract a lot of diverse opinions because obviously, uh, you know, you, you come in because you think there's a piece of information that's missing that you can provide that makes your evaluation of the, what the trading price should be better than, than what it currently is. So di attracting diversity is essential, as we know, for collective intelligence and, and crowd wisdom. The other element of crowd wisdom in the recipe to make a group smart is that you have to encourage independent thinking. So everybody, you know, there should be no pressure at all to conform to the uh, collective opinion. On the contrary, you should be incentivized to uh, express your own uh, very individual, very independent uh, thinking about the issue. And again, the betting proposition does that. Because when you're in a betting situation, you have to disagree, otherwise you can't participate. Right? You need to think this price on Trump is too low, is too low or this price on Trump is too high in order to participate. Uh, otherwise, you'll think, uh, if you think the price on, on Trump is correct, then you're not even participating at all because you have no reason to buy or sell. So the fact that you have to be in a contradictory mood with respect to what the current trading price is forces you to think independently. And that's the second big driver of what makes a group smart. And then finally, uh, there's also something that's overlooked by most economists, which is that the, the fact that you're in a betting situation also uh, changes the way your brain works. Right? So when you are in a situation for risk and reward, suddenly uh, it's like you shift your operating system in the brain. You go from you know, Mac OS to Windows or, or, you know, or the other way, depending on which you prefer. Uh, but uh, what happens is that you have these neural networks that normally would not be active that suddenly become active and light up that sort of depress your uh, emotional thinking and enhance, therefore, your logical thinking. You become much more focused. You, you think less about what you would like to happen, and you think more about what will actually happen. You become more objective. And that, there's neurological evidence to show that these brain networks uh, light up in betting situations compared to, let's say, answering a poll. So that's the third thing that makes uh, the market really smart. Now, onto your second question, which is, you know, why can we do better than these big data statistical analysis that, for example, 538 uh, provides uh, you know, several times a day, for example, regarding the, uh, the current race, the current political race. The reason is that no matter how good your statistical machine is, if you, you know, it's only as good as the, uh, the relevance of the data that you can uh, feed it. So those statistical machines can only feed on data that is already digital, that is already in some database somewhere. And most of what actually is relevant 
to a political election, especially in a year like this one where you know, the, the models that we used to apply before don't seem to apply at all to, to these weird candidates, uh, like UFOs, you know, out of nowhere. Uh, the models, you know, the data that that we have just doesn't cover, uh, I'd say, you know, 80 percent of what is relevant to this election. So if you have a beautiful statistical machine, but it only feeds on 20 percent of the useful data, because the rest of the data is not something that's in databases already, it's only something that the human brain can catch uh, from the air, uh, then it's actually quite easy to beat 538 at its own game. Wow. Um, yeah, that's really uh, that's really intriguing, actually. Um, and so, while we're talking about the um, uh, accuracy of um, prediction models, I wanted to know. So, you were um, we were just saying how you know prediction markets um, they kind of use that brain power um, to figure out things that statistical models can't. Um, and that's why um, they tend to be a little bit more accurate. But do you think it would be worth, um, if there was some way to somehow integrate, you know, using um, a prediction market and a statistical mar uh, statistical um, forecasting model, um, what do you think that would look like? And do you think that would be worth it to try to um, put those two together to get um, an even more accurate uh, forecasting model? Absolutely, and that's actually the uh, research topic for another multi-million dollar multi-year project that IAPA is trying to set up right now, which is how do you best mix uh, human forecasters and, and machine forecasting. And I, I think definitely there's a lot of uh, useful stuff to be done on that side. Um, my own opinion at the beginning of this research is that one of the best ways of doing that is to feed as much data as possible to the humans and let them sort it out uh, rather than try to uh, have the machines do any kind of uh, smart thinking. Because oh, wow. the human uh, brains and the diversity of, of their you know, backgrounds and everybody thinks differently, whereas you know, different computers think essentially the same. So you know, that diversity is really what you want in order to have a really smart forecasting machine. Um, that's very uh, that's very interesting. Um, and so um, with uh, that in mind, um, can you just go into a little bit about um, how you track the accuracy of a prediction market um, in your research? Sure, well, it's, it's pretty simple. We use uh, basically a distance to result. Uh, so I think it's called the Briar score. Uh, you can look it up in Wikipedia, the BRIER score, B-R-E-I, no, B-R-I-E-R. Um, and that's essentially a square, uh, you know, the, the square of the distance between trading price and the ultimate result. So in a, in a prediction market like predicted, you know, at the end, um, Trump is going to be valued at one or zero, right, one dollar or zero. Uh, and if he's trading at uh, 70, uh, two ends up being uh, one in Cleveland, uh, then the difference would be 0 0.3, and you take the square of that, and you get the, uh, you get essentially the Bryce score. So that gives you a, a measure of the accuracy of your market, and you, you to compute how accurate your market is over time. Uh, you just average the Bryce scores every day or uh, every time there's a trade, and you get a measure of how good the market was uh, from beginning to end. Wow. Um, yeah. So um, I would say, um, as far as um, people on the webinar, just wanted to um, send a quick reminder to you all. If you have a question for um, Dr. Emil von Schreiber, please email them to events at predictit.org. We're going to be doing our Q&A session pretty soon. Um, but right before that, um, Dr. Um, Emil, I wanted to ask you about prediction markets that are used um, for companies, since that's you know, a lot of what you do at Luminogic. So can you kind of explain the role of prediction markets in the private sector and um, what um, 
findings that um, you found through those private sector prediction markets? Right, so they're essentially used for uh, forecasting volumes or prices or uh, amount of stuff you're going to sell uh, through various metrics. So I think uh, Google has been using them to, to track, for example, how many bugs uh, will be uh, will be found in the latest version of Gmail, uh, or whether the new technological, new large technological project or product they will put out will be on time and on budget, and these kinds of things. So these are the types of predictions that we make uh, inside companies for various kinds of uh, actually all kinds of industries. Uh, it can go from you know aircraft builders like. Uh, Boeing, uh, Airbus have been using these things uh, all the way down to uh, uh, steel makers uh, or uh, Campbell Soup, right? The Campbell's actually has been using this as well to track the uh, sales that they could make on various uh, new kinds of products, for example. So new kinds of soups or new kinds of juices or whatever. So it applies obviously to all the industries, because they all have the same problem of figuring out how much uh, of a new product uh, they might be able to sell. So this is uh, this is essentially the application, and the results uh, across all these industries, uh, these, all these use cases, is that you the the market is using employees, you know, frontline employees, uh, tends to do better than the existing forecasting methods inside the company uh, about three quarters of the time. So 75% of the time the market is closer to the actual result than uh, the existing method. And it's closer uh, by about overall 20-25%. You know, so you, you get a boost in accuracy of about 25%. So these are impressive results. Uh, yet, yeah. politically, markets inside companies are, are complicated things. Uh, they tend to bother a lot of the people who who would like to uh, keep a monopoly on, on, on the information, and uh, nobody goes up and down to the boss or to the employees. And so, transparency is a is a regular issue with uh, corporate work. Um, yeah, that's that's very interesting. I, I had, um, it's funny that you were mentioning, um, you know, you're saying how Campbell Soup uses it, um, prediction markets for different types of um, uh, labels and um, soups and stuff that they are putting out in their company. Um, it's interesting to learn how um, prediction markets can be used in so many different ways in the private sector. Um, and so, um, finally, we just had one question uh, from uh, someone in the audience. So, thank you for sending that in. Um, so this um, person wants to know, still on the topic of um, uh, private sector prediction markets, um, how can smaller organizations utilize prediction markets? Um, we know that a lot of Fortune, 5 com Fortune 500 companies use them, but how might a smaller uh, company use a prediction market um, in a way that would be advantageous to them? Well, it depends on the question you're asking. It depends on how small you are. So in order to have a functioning market, that does anything useful, you need at least uh, 50 people involved. Right? Uh, if you have fewer than 50 people, it still works, but it sort of degrades, performance degrades more or less um, uh, gracefully. Uh, so you need to have a company that's big enough that it has a relevant panel that might be invited to forecast sales of a product or, or whatever, um, you know, the, at least 50. The alternative uh, is that you could also use a market that runs externally to the company in order to provide the company with a uh, external view of something that is relevant to the company. So most of the things that are, you know, there, there are lots of things that are relevant to a company that don't occur inside the company. So your business environment. Uh, whatever happens uh, with your competitors, uh, wherever your industry uh, sort of seems to be going in terms of trends. Uh, maybe you have some geopolitical issues. If your uh, oil company 
uh, you're interested in, in what happens in the politically in Venezuela, for example, or Brazil. So depending on the question you have, whether it's something internal, well, mostly the people inside would have the relevant knowledge, or whether it's something external uh, that happens anywhere anywhere else in the world and you need to have some expert on advice, advice on, on what's happening there because it's important for you, or whether maybe it's a panel of clients that you want to uh, figure out what they want, what they think is important, uh, and where they, where they think uh, your industry is going. Then you could also use markets externally to gather a crowd that is not uh, is not among your employees. Very insightful. Um, we actually have just have one last question, um, and this question is. How is your crowd forecasting method different from the Delphi, uh, Delphi method of estimation? Uh, well, I think prediction market is pretty different in the sense that it forces people uh, to confront and to disagree, whereas Delphi is focused on getting people to eventually reach consensus. In the market, you reach consensus eventually, but you do it by confrontation. Uh, direct confrontation and disagreement rather than you do by, by actively seeking consensus. So in the market, you know, the consensus is eventually where everybody agrees to disagree, which is a very different approach. Great. Um, well, um, I, we're at the end of our time here. Um, so as we come to the close of our webinar, I'd like to give you a big thank you, uh, Dr. Mill, uh, Sarvan Schreiber. Um, for sharing your insights with us this morning. It was all uh, very interesting. Um, and so thank you also to all of you who joined the webinar. I hope that you're having a great time on Predict It. Um, if you have any suggestions on who you'd like to see as a future guest on one of our webinars, um, please email your feedback to events at predictit.org. Thanks again, um, and have a great day. Thank you.